Uh, good morning, it's Rick Caesar here, and today we're looking at uh, really the the underlying uh, anatomy that makes uh, eyelid surgery so much fun, uh, namely the quite phenomenal blood supply to the eyelids. So fundamentally, we have your lovely lungs bringing oxygen down to the heart, the heart's pumping it out, and you're familiar that there is a rather huge beast, the common carotid artery, which splits into the internal carotid, which essentially passes through to the brain, and the external carotid. And these two huge uh, sources of lovely oxygenated blood anastomose around the eyelids. And when you understand how, uh, you'll appreciate why we have such a fantastic uh, recovery rate from our surgery. So if you want a, a very quick kind of overview before we start talking about anything here, here, here we have the, uh, the common, common carotid blasting in there at the bottom, uh, splitting into the internal carotid, internal carotid which then passes up at and in, which we're therefore not looking at particularly from that point on with this image. And you have the external carotid, uh, and the external carotid gives rise to the facial, the maxillary, which comes through to the infraorbital, um, through to the uh, transverse uh, zygomatic, and the superficial temporal. So it's a lovely a lovely quick overview to kind of orientate yourselves. So, what does the internal carotid do? And I apologise because this slide is obviously initially a little bit dull, but the really important branch from our point of view of the internal carotid is the ophthalmic artery. And the ophthalmic artery splits as it Pent goes into the uh, posterior point of the orbit, it splits into the dorsal nasal, the supratrochlear, the supraorbital. On the other side, the anterior ethmoidal, the posterior ethmoidal, the lacrimal, the zygomatic facial, and the zygomatic temporal. In other words, all of these little arteries are coming off the ophthalmic artery, which is coming off the internal carotid. And the external carotid, again, dull slide, but you have to just go through the names. So the external carotid gives rise to the facial artery, the maxillary artery, which crucially gives the infraorbital supply, the transverse facial, the superficial temporal, the frontal and parietal versions of, of which. Now, where is this fantastic anastomosis? Well, if you consider this shape here, so we go from here, round there, round the lower lids, over the eye, up over the forehead, round the eyes, and back down, that is the primary supply of the internal carotid. So the internal carotid effectively is giving you your arterial supply to all of this zone, but of course not on its own. It's all supported by the external carotid. And if you want to remember that shape, all you've got to do is think about the card, the club. So if we first consider the internal carotid, here it comes, powering in blood supply, and then the ophthalmic artery comes off, and the ophthalmic artery comes into the orbit, and we have the uh, posterior ethmoidal, we have the anterior ethmoidal, we have the branch going to the supraorbital, have the branch going to the supratrochlea, and we have the uh, dorsal nasal branch. 
On the other side, we have the lacrimal. We have the zygomatic temporal. And we have the zygomatic facial. So quick comprehension. So in comes the internal carotid. Off the internal carotid comes the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery in the orbit splits into anterior and posterior ethmoidal, which are then going off into the nose, the supraorbital, the supratrochlea, and the dorsal nasal, or medially and laterally. It's going to the zygomatico, so to the lacrimal to the zygomatico-temporal and to the zygomatico-facial. Looking at it from the front, worth considering again. So in comes the ophthalmic artery. You've got the posterior and anterior ethmoidal. You've got the branch giving you your supraorbital. You've got a branch giving you your supratrochlea. You've got your dorsal nasal branch and on the other side you've got a lacrimal branch you have the zygomatico temporal branch and you have zygomatico facial all off the ophthalmic artery which is all off the internal carotid if we now consider the a supply from the external carotid so the the external carotid is then continuing up into the temporal area. It's passing across the face as the facial artery. It's passing on the other side of the mandible and coming in as the maxillary artery leading to the infraorbital artery and there's often another branch the transverse facial uh, coming in from the side so we have the uh, superficial temporal we have the transverse facial we have the deep maxillary giving the infraorbital and we have the facial artery in terms of anastomoses the facial artery is coming in and of course is giving the most fantastic anastomosis in this zone the maxillary into the infraorbital artery is giving the most fantastic anastomosis in this zone, the transverse facial is coming in and giving the most fantastic anastomosis here. And the uh, superficial temporal is coming in and ultimately giving a fantastic anastomosis here. So the, you can appreciate that the supply once you combine your internal carotid and external carotid is a humming and vibrant uh, flow so the transverse facial is coming in joining the infraorbital and the facial these are all coming from the external carotid coming up and via the angular artery joining slight color change choice just to make it obvious joining the supply from the internal carotid now this anastomosis zone therefore means that the upper whole of the upper lid and the whole of the lower lid are having blood pumped in via the superior and inferior palpable arterial arches and that blood is coming from both internal and 
external carotid med medially and laterally. Uh, so the, the extraordinary um, uh, supply coming into the eyelids is this full-on overlapping anastomosis of the external and internal carotid. So how are you going to apply this knowledge? Well, you want to know where you can safely inject your anesthesia to minimise the chances of hitting a large vessel and you don't want to get a big bruise. You want to know when you're doing your dissections where to anticipate and control the bleeding. When you're doing a DCR, you fundamentally need to understand why you're going to need to avoid the angular vessels. If you're constructing vascularized flaps, you need to know on which blood supply you're basing their construction. And then here's the lovely thing. You just want to appreciate that all this lovely oxygen is why ocular plastic surgery works so well. You may be an excellent surgeon, you may be an average surgeon, but when your blood supply to the tissues you're dealing with is so beautifully overlapped and comprehensive, the chances are that your surgery is going to survive. Again, just have this concept. So, considering what we were just saying, places which is safe to inject local anesthesia, very safe to inject transconjunctivally uh, in the lower lid, very safe to inject in the upper lid pretty much anywhere around the lid crease, very safe to inject laterally, uh, pay great attention, basically not safe really anywhere in this zone, uh, the chances of a bruise are quite likely. Now, DCR. If you're making an incision somewhere around here, you have this rather fantastic problem of the angular vessels pumping your blood both this way and that way. So if you were to hit the angular vessels, there's no use just trying to stop the bleeding from this end because an equal amount of blood is being pumped in from the other end. So if you do have bleeding here, remember that by placing pressure both here and here, you'll often be able to control the bleeding well enough in order to tie off uh, the artery or to cauterize the artery. When you're considering creating forehead flaps, you have your supraorbital and your supratrochlear blood supply. And so you can create fantastic uh, flaps on either side and these flaps are fully vascularized and can rotate uh, very usefully uh, for particularly for large defects uh, in the this area. If you're considering uh, helicopter flaps, then the transverse facial artery and its anastomoses and all the other anastomoses coming through into the orbicularis uh, laterally through the lacrimal, zygomatic temporal, zygomatic facial means that you have a, a rotation point around here uh, around which you can turn almost any flap uh, uh, both clockwise and anti-clockwise. So for example, you could take a flap from here and you could rotate it round to here. And that will have a blood supply uh, 
coming from this rich anastomosis just there. Now, obviously, art arterial supply pumping everything in. Well, you've got to have a lovely venous drainage taking everything away again. And unsurprisingly, this drains back internally and externally. So if we're following a, a fairly gravitational path, the veins will go back down a supratrochlear, back down a supraorbital. On the other laterally, they'll go back down the lacrimal and that will flow through to the superior ophthalmic vein, which goes into the cavernous sinus, which then goes into the internal jugular. Uh, the inferior ophthalmic vein uh, will pass, uh, will, will collect from the uh, upper lid and lower lid, and that will pass also through to the cavernous sinus and the internal jugular, but it will also pass to the pterygoid plexus which goes to the retromandibular, which goes to the external jugular. So in the same way as there's an anastomosis for the arterial supply, there's also an enormous overlap for the venous drainage. And on the external side, the supratrochlea, and on the nasal side, the angular and the nasal, will also go through to the inferior ophthalmic, which then picks up the inferior orbital, going through to the maxillary retromandibular out to the external jugular. And very much on the surface of the face, the facial vein goes to the external jugular, and the superficial temporal goes to the retromandibular, which goes to the external jugular. So the external jugular is performing a very similar task to the uh, external carotid, and an appreciation of how this all flows. This is a beautiful old uh, diagram, but it's as relevant today as it ever was. And so, uh, again, you're looking at the uh, superficial temporal supply flowing into the retromandibular. And as the retromandibular flows down, it picks up a supply from the facial and that flows into the internal jugular and external jugular. So where's all this blood coming from? Well, the blood flows back down the supraorbital, supratrochlear, the nasal, and this flows into the superior ophthalmic vein, uh, picking up drainage from the lacrimal, uh, the zygomatic temporal, and these flow through to the cavernous sinus, joined by the uh, inferior uh, ophthalmic vein, uh, which also drains down into the pterygoid plexus. In addition to this, uh, there is the flow from the infraorbital vein, which is then passing uh, deep uh, through the maxillary vein, but this then passes into the retromandibular vein. And the retromandibular vein also collects from the uh, superior temporal uh, vein, uh, which passes uh, down into, effectively join, forms the uh, retromandibular vein. And this also picks up a supply from the facial vein before uh, joining and uh, also providing supply to the external uh, jugular. So the, the cavernous sinus drains into the internal jugular, whereas the uh, superficial temporal goes to the retromandibular, uh, which is also supplied by the facial vein. Looking at it from the front, again, the supraorbital vein, the supratrochlear vein, the nasal, the lacrimal, the zygomatic, all join 
into the uh, superior ophthalmic. There's also the inferior ophthalmic, uh, uh, and then there's the uh, infraorbital. The infraorbital uh, supplies down into the uh, retro mandibular, which also drains the superficial temporal. Uh, so once and the facial, of course, also comes through into this external jugular. So there's an internal and external uh, drainage supply. Now really this is made much simpler. Where there is an artery, there's a vein. So really, uh, in terms of anatomy and in terms of studying this, uh, as long as you know where your arteries are, you pretty much have an understanding as an oculoplastic surgeon as to where the veins are. Uh, you'd be very pleased to know that you should not be ever going anywhere near the cavernous sinus. Again, here we have the, uh, the nomenclature of all the arteries. And just to back up what we were just saying, you inevitably have superior and inferior palpable veins flowing into infraorbital, flowing into facial veins, flowing into uh, angular veins, in dorsal nasal veins, supratrochlear veins, supraorbital veins, etc. In other words, where there's an artery, there's a vein. Now, this is really rather important. So we're going to put a little box around it. Remember, everyone is different. And the reason you need to know your anatomy is so you can show off and be surprised. And you can say, my word, I wasn't expecting there to be an artery there. Uh, in other words, always be careful with your surgery. Uh, quite clearly, uh, the knowledge of where the anatomy, your knowledge of the anatomy, so you know where the arteries are most likely to be, is going to help you very much. And remembering the tissue planes, so understanding the depth of the artery and the position of the artery in relation to the muscle is going to be very helpful. Thank you very much.